All right, today I'm with a special guest here, Jason Kingsley of Modern History TV and co-founder and CEO of Rebellion Developments, which produced such obscure and underrated series as Alien vs. Predator and Sniper Elite. <laughs> you might have heard of them, I don't know, but kidding I, aside... I, I, always, I always assume people don't know us, so I think that's probably the right way around rather than assuming you're, you're known about. I think it's better to assume you're not known Oh yeah, about. that's true, but I, I feel like, like anyone who's a gamer probably is aware of those series. So either way, uh, thank you very much for taking the time to have a chat with me. I'm sure you're, you have a busy schedule, so I appreciate that. It's always a pleasure to, to speak to fellow YouTubers because I've got, I, I wear two hats. I've got my, my yeah. YouTube channel and, and horses and things, all things medieval. Uh, and I'm interested in the sort of practical side of ordinary people's lives in the medieval period. Obviously swords and weapons and wearing armor I, I have I have and do joust in in historically authentic armor um, but then the other side of my business that allows me to do all of that is is uh, being a CEO of a tech company which has its own um, challenges as well as you can imagine you know the the games industry is not that happy at the moment there's a lot of redundancies happening right uh, and in the market's shifting and changing as people consume media differently so so I straddle two worlds and people are often slightly shocked when they put two and two together and realize I am the same person. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not obvious if, if they know you from one context and then see you in the other. You do a lot of horseback related uh, mm. topics, uh, combat and all. You have plenty of experience with that. Now, personally, my experience is extremely limited. It's basically limited to cutting bottles on an e-bike or while well, leaning out of a moving car. Even that made me kind of acutely aware of the risk of accidentally hitting the bike or car, especially if the weapon glances <laughs> or bounces off the target. I imagine you're even more careful with that when it comes to horses, right? I'll tell you what's interesting. The, the, the key thing with horses is it's another living creature. Yes. So it has has, it, it's very different to a motorbike or it's very different to sitting on a, a chair and pretending to ride a horse you have the physicality of the horse itself you know each horse is a different shape you know your 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 legs will be in slightly different positions depending on the sort of nature of the saddlery the height you are off the ground you know, medieval horses are typically what we would call fairly small but stocky horses by modern sports horse standards i use a variety of weapons i use blunt weapons for practice i use wooden swords like they would have done in the medieval period but i also use sharps and the reason I use sharps is because they move through the air differently. You'll, you'll mm. know from cutting. Yeah. You know, but when you're cutting a target uh, or cutting at a target, it's very different. Things like spears, for example. Uh, if you're on foot, a spear can jab in and you can pull it back out again. If you're on horse, you're running past the target or or running at an angle to the target. And if that spear goes in too far, or the lance, you are it's going to be awkward and it's at the end of a long lever and as we all know levers levers do odd things physics physics doesn't care um uh, that it's under your arm or locked into a lance rest and it can properly throw you out of the saddle or even upset you it can knock you to one side or another um and I think that's partly why medieval saddles were so high at the front and the back typically hmm because they allow for that kind of wiggle room. The key thing I teach people though, whenever anybody wants to learn about horse combat is, the horse is your legs. And if you are too far away from the target, doesn't matter how good you are handling a sword or an ax, it's not gonna hit that target. That's actually one of the questions I had for you. The, um, the issue of as you ride past someone, obviously not all mounted combat is riding past a foot soldier or another mounted horseman. Sometimes you might fight while you know, stand still or going mm. slowly. But in that sort of situation, the charge, I find a horseman's pick actually kind of an odd choice for uh, mounted combat because when I imagine going past someone, you swing that and the pick gets stuck in the body. They're often curved. So I've done this against ballistic heads and I'm always a little careful showing things that are too gruesome on the <laughs> right. channel. I have noticed that the design is curved so it goes into the crown of the target. And you don't have to hit very hard. The, the, the slightly shocking thing for me, I notice when practicing with something like a mace or a horseman's pick is you almost don't swing it with effect. You swing it with accuracy and sort of pock, 
onto the top of somebody's head. I just realized while you were talking about that, the way I had envisioned that, the, you know, the, the horseman's pick getting stuck, it was a very different approach that I'm now thinking is suboptimal. Because the way I was thinking was you add your swing really to the, the speed of the horse and, and you swing, you know, kind of like a, a rise, like an uppercut, basically. Mm -hmm. um, but that, of course, when if you pass someone like this and the pick enters the body, now it's either going to be violently wrenched out or it's going to be stuck and you lose the weapon or you get pulled out of the saddle. But the way... You describe it and did it in the video was dropping down like that, so yeah, you don't down, yeah. you don't actually have that problem. But when it comes to using swords on horseback, you know this whole uh, cutting versus thrusting on horseback. Throughout history, we've had different emphasis on it. Sometimes it's just basically just cutting. Sometimes it's just thrusting. Sometimes it's both. What's your opinion on that? I think thrusts are potentially dangerous because the sword can go in and go through. Some of the, uh, you know, later cavalry swords in, you know, era of um, guns, uh, a little more than quite narrow. They're, they're like rapiers. They're mm -hmm. straight and narrow. Some of them. Um, I think uh, that that sword would just go straight through a human being. Yeah. Because they don't wear armor. I think it would just go straight through, and then pulling out. There's a technique to twist your arm and to allow your arm to, to, to bend in the right way in the cavalry manuals. Mm. And that's assuming that the blade, you're going to be going past and the blade is going to be pulled out, but spin spin the body. So you stab them going forwards and then you ride past and you rotate right. your arm and pull the blade out. I also tend to favor the idea of, as you say, hitting on the top of the head. Mm -hmm because um, people often get rid of their helmets and armor to run away faster and you're not going to run away faster than a horse uh, no. but people think they can the way to take people out most efficiently is to tap them on the head mm -hmm. and i do mean just tap them on the head mm -hmm. with a horseman's pick or equivalent you hit somebody on the head it really hurts yeah um, you hit somebody hard enough just to crack the skull you're going to give them a concussion they're going to fall to the ground maybe there'll be maybe your foot soldiers will follow up uh, but they're gone they're gone and you don't have to hit something very hard one of the things i did with a horseman's pick against a ballistic helmet is i the first time we did it for filming i thought i had to swing quite hard mm -hmm. and of course with a quite a hard swing you lose accuracy uh, potentially um and you've got to recover that that weapon as well and you mustn't hit your horse and i think a cut as you go past with a saber is is more likely to do damage into somebody's chest and face as they're running away they can't see you they can drop to the floor but then they're not running anymore mm -hmm. uh, you ride past them you strike backwards and upwards into them as they're running away you've you've just struck whatever you've done and then you ride on to cut the next person down and as you said probably light cavalry in particular was used for that job of clearing up broken foot that's a good point is um mm. one of the things I, I thought of as a question is you know the um the concept that the the speed of the galloping horse adds to the velocity of your swing at least if you swing in the direction like you pointed mm. out in a video if, if you do it if you do a backhand swing it's the opposite it actually subtracts but um yeah. so the if you wanted to maximize the force of the impact you would swing with uh, the in the direction that you're going yeah but how desirable is that even is the question because like you said I, I, you're sacrificing think... accuracy and it's probably overkill anyway that's the novice swing you sort of you swing with the horse it's actually slightly mechanically awkward as well because hmm. you um you've got one of the ways of trying this out is to sit on a chair with the chair back in front of you and then try and use a sword that way and you mm -hmm. suddenly realize there's a thing in the way and it's very different right. from very different from foot combat um uh, and i think they would have trained in lots of different ways i find the backhand strike is very powerful um what's interesting for me is the near side so my so striking i'm right-handed striking on the left hand side of me but going forwards also seems quite natural mm. as well right it's um it's but it's much closer the skill of the rider is a very important part mm -hmm. but ultimately if the horse knows what it's doing the horse will get you into the right position 
if the horse is clever and won't get you into the right position, it doesn't matter what you do, <laughs> you're not in the right, you're not, you know, you're not on target. You, you're not going to hit. You know, if your legs won't take you where they need to, where you need to go to do your tatami cutting, no matter how good your technique is, you're going to miss that mat. So. Right, that's something that uh, I also thought about. When, when, you're, when you're fighting on foot, and particularly in a duel, where you have space to move around, it's all about the footwork, of course. Like, you can do a lot with evasive footwork, even if somebody swings as hard as they can. Um, you don't have to block that statically, you can move around. But if, you, if there are two cavalrymen approaching each other, the horse, of course, has the ability to move sideways. But in if they approach each other fast, I'm imagining it's almost like two trains coming toward mm -hmm. each other. So if one swings, you can't just sidestep or whatever. You, you have to deal with no, it. No, there right? are there are techniques. There are simple techniques to deflect a lance, but it takes mm -hmm. um it, it takes guts to <laughs> yeah. actually deflect that lance. Because you, you have to actually wrong, parry it. You can't just dodge. You, yeah, yeah. You you have to par parry, catch it, and guide it away, and then mm -hmm. you can use the lance to slide up and strike them and we see this in fury in a, in a couple of moves which are surprisingly simple probably very difficult to do for real they're, mm. they're quite easy to do in training because nobody's actually trying to stab you in the face right um but the various techniques you can do as a as a as a cavalry man with with that lance is lowering the lance at the last minute which makes it dramatically harder for that parry to happen typically you want to use the speed of the horse in motion but horses can carousel they can bounce on the spot and they can go mm. sideways they can spin around but they're very advanced techniques and not not all horses would do that and i think cavalry are used in lots of different ways as well the, the advantage you've got as a cavalry man is height you can see above everybody else which is presumably why the sort of leadership class whatever you want to call it reverted to being on horseback you can move around quickly uh, you can get into and out of trouble quickly, and you can see trouble coming because your your head is at about eight and eight foot ish, which is well above the helmets of your foot. If you think about the space of a one cavalryman, probably takes up the space of at least two, if not four, close packed infantry. Mm. So four against one, you're you're done. You know if you're you know, but you've got the height and you've got not necessarily the reach. Depends on the weapons. But you do have the speed and the intimidation factor. And I always wonder, medieval people would probably be more used to beasts like that, beasts of burden, pack ponies, mules, all sorts of things. So possibly wouldn't be as intimidated as, as, a, as a modern city dweller, but they're still big. And when it's coming at you with um, intention, <laughs> You know, morale is a big thing, and yeah. even if you're surrounded by your mates, I always think this is funny. The first person to run probably gets away. <laughs> yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> the same way as yeah. the the first person they get at the front lines yeah. is probably not going to make yeah. it, or especially the first person to scale the walls during yeah. a siege. There's no yeah. chance. There's no way. They know they're going to die going up there, right? Pretty much. It's, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah it's, it's pretty much 0% survival. The, the, literally, the Napoleonic idea of the forlorn hope. They were literally volunteers. We've now blown the walls of this castle, and we now think it's um, navigable or whatever. It's practical. I think they called it practical. Uh, and that, that basically means there's a slope of rubble. And <laughs> yeah. the other side know that's where you're coming. So they're going to be aiming their cannon with grape shot at you. And you're going to volunteer to go up that slope. And at some stage, they're going to shoot that cannon, aren't they? At you. I think and you, you're might, be, you die, might be volunteered or voluntold, yeah. as they say. Because yeah. <laughs> I, I think I, I, it does I, I, require a certain amount of pressure to force somebody into that situation. Yeah, but apparently they were largely volunteers, and the, I think the reward was if you led the forlorn hope, and you survived, you automatically got um, uh, got elevated to the next sort of notch up. Right. In the, uh, if you're an officer, and, and that's people quite are hard. people have a way of uh, overestimating themselves and overestimating yeah. their odds. All these bad things can happen, but it's not going to happen to me, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yes, people have a sense of invulnerability, especially when they're younger. 
Yes, and isn't that the case that typically most of the... I think most of the people that fought in the medieval period were late teens, early 20s, mm-hmm. maybe led by people in their late 20s, maybe early 30s. The odd king was probably 30s to 40s. So you've got a group of uh, unattached, testosterone fueled <laughs> young men who know they're invulnerable, they know they're, they're, it's not going to be them. And I think that's what happens these days, isn't it? It's mostly, you know, conscription, True. modern conscription, I think tends to be sort of 19, 20, 18 year olds, mm-hmm. probably able to be manipulated more by exactly. other yeah. people. Limited uh, experience. And, hmm. And I'm sure it's the same. I'm sure. I'm sure we would be shocked by the youth of most medieval armies. It's the same in Roman armies too. You have the young men in the front, the older experience in the back. And there's a number of reasons for it. I'm sure you also have the the dimension that the the experienced veterans are supposed to keep them from routing basically like make sure yeah. they stay there and, and don't just run away because like you've mentioned morale is a is a big factor and mm. uh quite often if an army routes they you might actually be more likely to die if you break and run because if you stay in formation you have that protection of the mm. formation if you disperse you might just be run down with cavalry and then the the casualties might be even higher you've got combined arms there is no one perfect solution on the battlefield. You know, people talk about what's the best sword, <laughs> right? But well, it kind of depends on your circumstances. Yes. You know, are you a um, a bodyguard in the streets of Venice, where you might want a huge Montante sword, really there to be very effective fighting weapon, but to keep the area clear and have them not attack you and intimidate them to not attacking you? Because after all, the best way of winning a battle is not to actually fight the battle in the first place. Are you in a close formation, in which case you probably want a short stabbing blade, maybe like the Gladius? Are you in a street fight, and is a dagger better in a in scuffle? Tavern brawl, or tavern, exactly, well, or even so, against armor. As, as soon as you come to grappling in armor, suddenly the dagger is king. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Going through the eye slots and in, you know, literally levering that um, that dagger in and underneath plates and trying to get at the the juicy flesh (laughs) and those daggers are quite good at piercing the mail that that covers the gaps so Uh, absolutely uh, the the question the the whole question of what's best you know what's the best weapon and this and that also is related to another question that people often ask is why didn't they do this and that earlier for example hand protection on hills you know why didn't they put complex hills or at least a knuckle guard on earlier in history um I have a certain response. What's your response to that kind of question? I don't think those cross guards are necessarily for protecting the hand. I also don't think that swords were often used as anything other than a backup weapon. You know, it's your last re- weapon of last resort. I I think the king of the battlefield is the spear. Yeah. I I, I think we the spear, a long stick with a sharp point, isn't. Uh, isn't as romantic as a sort of a beautifully shaped golden hilted broadsword or you know gladius or Spartha or whatever it might be um but i think if we were to look at the statistics pretty much everybody <laughs> would have a spear and use that so one of the reasons for me testing things out is this is this is what people think does it make sense do, is that something i would do and of course, mm. one of the problems in history is it, it, it probably varied quite a lot. You know, we talk about the medieval era and it's like, oh, well, that's a thousand years. Well done. And, then, yeah. and, 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 and in lots of different parts of the world. So my idea about hand protection, I mean, I think one of the, I remember talking to an archaeologist and they said one of the ways they tried to find the front line at Bosworth, for example, Bosworth Battlefield, um, is from the um, increased findings of finger bones. Hmm. Um, right. They don't really find much in the way of useful, you know, of material left behind. But of course, finger bones aren't going to be picked up by those people clearing the battlefield afterwards and scavenging for, you know, somebody's helmet can be resold. You know, it might be covered in gore, but it can be taken off, and mm-hmm. the leather and the buckles are all useful. 
you know the body gets i don't know burnt in a big pit but anything useful but the fingers might have been taken off and then fall into the mud be trodden in right. and if you look at the distribution of finger bones that seems to be a thing it always confuses me because i you know hands are always getting hit in sparring yeah um even even on horse in horse combat i've done tournament with um clubs fairly short clubs and the idea was to knock the uh, crest off the other person's helmet we we did it with magnets uh, they were stuck on with magnets of course not medieval but that was the easiest thing to do and it was quite fun but even then you put your hand up in a gauntlet to defend yourself you get the positioning wrong they hit you really hard mm -hmm. on the on the hand or from below and the gauntlets only cover the, the, the back of your hand a little bit there's plenty of flesh available and so we ended up with the surprising number of hand injuries when and it comes back to your question why didn't they and i guess i guess we'll never really know yeah what's your theory i mean it depends there's quite a bit of a difference between battlefield fighting and dueling so when it comes to battlefields you have shields typically so if, if you're if you're able to protect the hand with a shield that only goes so far of course because you still have to strike with that with that main hand you can't keep it behind the shield perfectly there are some techniques to try to keep it behind the shield as much as possible but every now and then it's going to be exposed and that's of course the leading target that's the closest to the opponent and it's the lowest risk target for the opponent because they can hit your hand when you're not even able to touch them at all with your weapon so the hands are always very exposed especially in dueling but also on the battlefield and that's true of course also when you're using pole arms you know like a, a spear or a pole axe or whatever else really those hands are just juicy targets on the haft and it, somebody if somebody makes contact with the haft with their blade they can just slide down or they can target the hands directly etc when it comes to pole arms really your only option is gauntlets but we have side swords and rapiers with all that extra hand protection and they started with that gradually first you've got the the extra ring on the cross guard then you may have a knuckle guard and they add more and more rings so clearly they felt the need for that they they noticed okay actually we're on to something here so let's develop that further why did did they not do it earlier well they just didn't sometimes it's as simple as that the same way as they didn't invent steam engines in the middle ages arguably they could have like they yeah well, didn't Hero of Alexandria have a, a sort of a spinning steam sphere? Yeah. Uh, so, so the the concept was known for thousands of years. Same as guns. I mean, guns. Yeah. They were very crude devices. Um, they stank of sulphur, <laughs> which of course is associated with the devil. Yeah. And I and I wonder whether that was a not touching that. That's definitely bad uh, <laughs> thing going on there, or whether everybody was just used to fighting in a certain way mm. and this new fangled stuff was very expensive and uh, nobody really understood it it seems like it takes a, a several series of breakthroughs in tactics possibly in the way people expect to fight battles as well um uh, I, I mean i think you know the, the idea of napoleonic men in red coats in a line marching relentlessly with short-range weapons in the face of cavalry and in the face of artillery shooting at them taking out a column of men with a massive iron ball and you keeping on going is just extraordinary and then getting to within 50 yards stopping preparing and shooting a massive volley and keeping on going um and a huge cloud of smoke you can't see anything anyway now so maybe that's for the, for the best you, <laughs> you don't know what's happening uh, human beings are i don't know we, we seem to have this capacity for self-destruction <laughs> yes, on the battlefield very much so and we always like to think we're oh so rational but there are the limits we, we don't always do what's most rational sometimes sometimes we even do something that we know isn't good <laughs> then after the fact like, why did i do that or people try to rationalize why they did what they did. And there's mm. sometimes, sometimes it can be as simple as a certain, you know, cultural conservatism or like, for example, if you look at Egyptian artwork, um, they had very rigid um, 
standards for how to do art. And it wasn't about individual expression. You know, now, nowadays we look at art as a personal individual expression. Back then it was, a, this is how we do art. You know, every, everyone mm. does, this is how you portray figures. There's a brilliant kind of cartoon, I think comic, it's obviously, and it's got a bunch of people in Egyptian poses. And, and then there's a, there's a bloke sort of leaning kind of, um, with his hips sort of canted and in the in the Greek style, hmm. and I think the the party go the Egyptian party goers are saying, yeah, he's just come back from ancient Greece where they're <laughs> experimenting with a new art form. It might be that it takes an innovative leader in a position of power to have a go at risking new technology. Hmm. And I was trying to map this onto new games consoles and new technology, and how when we went from to sort of bitmapped bitmap artwork 2d mostly to 3d the industry had a big falling out because mm -hmm. a lot of people couldn't cope with the maths of the 3d space you know the, the the 2d sprites were were very manageable everybody understood them but when it moved to 3d it became much more specialized mm -hmm. and i'm and i'm looking at wars today and seeing drone combat taking seemingly taking over us nerds have kind of won the culture wars you know everybody watches marvel shows and lord of the rings shows and all that kind of stuff on telly um and sort of proper cinema tm whatever that means has taken mm -hmm. a back seat for the moment um and it almost seems like nerds and tech people are taking over war now no longer it's a roughly tufty bloke with super fitness and a and a, and a gun um, it's it's us kind of <laughs> FP, you know, first person flying drones taking out really expensive tanks. Um, and so I think we're going through another revolution in technology. We're observing it in real time. And it's possibly only with hindsight that you can see the changes. Yeah. That's why it's so difficult to predict anything. We sometimes also get questions like, you know, what do you think in 500 years, you know, what, what kind of weapon will we have then? Or do you think melee weapons will ever make a comeback with different technologies? And it's like, it's fun to speculate about, but we have absolutely no idea. I mean, if you had <laughs> asked somebody in the year, say, 1400, if you had been able to show them Napoleonic warfare, their reaction would be quite interesting. They would have probably been like, what on earth is happening here? You're insane. Why are you just marching toward each other, shooting each other? Like, this is, yeah. there's no honor, there's no chivalry. I mean, the French knights had that experience, basically, mm -hmm. against English longbowmen, where they're suddenly like, yeah. wait, how are commoners killing us? We're supposed to be taken for ransom and, and treated nicely, and now we're we're dying from arrows yeah. shot by this commoners. This is literally, literally against the natural order of things yeah. that, 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 that that the creator had ordained. Yeah, we yeah. we should cut them down. In fact, we don't even we don't even count the size of armies with anything other than the number of knights in the army. The the, the foot soldiers are there for the knights to chopped down i suppose yeah. back in the day some rules of engagement it's like a, you know posh people posh rich people shouldn't be killed in battle i wonder if our political leaders had to go onto the front line and really fight how much money would be spent on the tech and the equipment to protect them you know, that's if the, yeah. if the president had to go to battle <laughs> for real they, they would um, probably develop mechs straight up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you would see exactly. them in, in yeah. giant towering mech and yeah. go at it. Exactly. Whereas I'm thinking it should be the opposite. You want to go start a war? Yeah, fight at the front line. Let's see yeah. how willing you are to start a war now. Somebody once famous said wars are started by old men and And, and by fought young. by young men, yeah. Yeah, um, it's a bit of a dark perspective, but I think it's always been that way. Mm -hmm. And then you sometimes you look back at history and you think of why people were fighting <laughs> and if you actually boil it down it's like that, that group of people want more taxes from a bigger group <laughs> yeah. of people it comes down to cash every yeah. time almost every time all right i'm sure we could keep talking for hours about various topics but uh, let's wrap it up here so thank you again for taking the time to have this chat i hope everybody enjoyed it i've really enjoyed it because it's um making videos sometimes quite sort of um solo experience exactly having, yeah having a dialogue is really good because we can we could discuss ideas with our each of our own practical experiences and the fact that we have both done a little bit of tournament work and a little bit of competitive fighting for real um i, I think adds a certain you know understanding 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, often, and often a certain humbleness because you know you don't know an awful lot of things about oh, yeah. something. It, basically, every time somebody asks me about mounted combat, I'm, I'm just telling them, well, you, you need to ask somebody with the relevant skill set because it's not mine. I have no idea about horses or mounted <laughs> combat. And uh, in general, I have more of a, a dueling perspective anyway rather than battlefield combat. So it's, it's great to compare notes. And uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure to talk about these you know, delightfully geeky topics. <laughs> the link uh, to part two will be on the Modern History TV channel. And uh, yeah, that's about it.